all about this and oh, this meeting is being recorded got it uh jose torero feeling uh, uncomfortable about this wanted to do something about it and that's how we started to work on the topic at this point, I want to bring the, com the, the comment of Professor Brannigan from the University, University of Maryland. Not only is a fire scientist and an engineer, he's also a, a lawyer. So he says the Titanic, you know what happened to the Titanic. He says that, that to remind us that the Titanic complied with all the codes of the time. And then he makes the note, if it fall, if it sunk, but it was complying with all the codes, is because lawyers can make the device legal, but only engineers can make them safe. So and this is important. We very often use the Euro code and the standard as a way to make our designs legal, kind of like being approved by the authorities. And, and maybe we would like to go to the next level of making sure that it's safe. This is related to the discussion of performance-based engineering uh, and performance and prescribed uh, based engineering. Uh, one of them seems to be looking into just making the device legal. And the other one is uh, trying to, to make the device safe and, and the two and prove it that it's safe. So it is, I think it's important to the concept of, of today. We, we are talking about unchecked assumptions that most people will feel comfortable not checking, uh, but maybe that was actually not bringing safety. It was just bringing legality to the design. The World Trade Center was not the first, not the last of the real accidents where fires seem to be moving around the enclosure, the compartment. Now we call those names, uh, Barbara Lane from Arup uh, gave, gave name to these uh, fires. She called them in a discussion on email, traveling fires. And since then it has catch. So traveling fire has been observed in, in many different buildings, in the Faculty of Architecture in Delft, the Windsor Tower in Madrid, obviously the World Trade Center, the Interstate Bank, 1998. So we actually, we started to go back into the history and saying, actually, you know what? The World Trade Center was not the first time traveling fires were observed. This actually happens very often. When you talk to firefighters around the world, they tell you, is, it, is this new for you that fires travel? Yeah, it's new, it's, we are very excited. And says, I, I see this on a weekly basis, that fire travel. I said, well, yeah, that's our field catching up. Since then, also there have been even experiments uh, doing analysis of traveling fires. Um, this is a list where you can see the experiments in reverse order. I would like to start from the bottom. In 1958, in Canada, they conducted experiments in real compartments. They were burning a real town. And, and then upon analyzing the data 50 years later, 60 years later, we realized actually they captured traveling fires. They had no idea. They had captured them, they had no interest in their behavior, but actually they were reporting far traveling behavior. Uh, they also, Cardington, even Cardington had traveling behavior. They were not interested whatsoever. They were actually saying very strange behavior. Next page. Um, Edinburgh has conducted two sets of experiments that they started early on. Um, many of the leading worker people, the researchers that were doing this work are in Queensland now. SP with David Lang and in Edinburgh in, in Imperial, we've been doing experiments. Also, Arup has been doing experiments more recently. So it's, it's growing scientific work, uh, growing uh, observations in real fires, so traveling, the fires can travel. This is an image of one of the experiments that we conducted in Warsaw in 2017. The paper was actually, it took us ages to publish the paper. It's just been accepted for publication in fire technology. This was a very large compartment. In the video, you might think that it was not very large, but it's actually the largest uh, compartment that has been put on fire um, in the history of science. Obviously, maybe people have done this for bigger fires, particularly um, uh, firefighters maybe, but it was not for science. They were not observing and collecting data and studying the behavior. Something that I just want to highlight, I, I could be giving a whole talk just on this experiment or other experiments that came before us. What we saw is we saw progress of the burning. We, we saw that the fire was not burning uniformly. We saw that the compartment temperature was not uniform. So we already check that the two assumptions that the Eurocode does, they were actually not applicable. So it is true that at least at 380 meters square of floor area, the temperature and the burning are not uniform. We saw continuous fire moving, accelerating in particular, not at a steady state. And what we did not observe is flashover. We saw acceleration that was at the, uh, towards the end particularly fast, but we did not see flashover. There are three criteria for flashover. Uh, you can go to Dreisel to see them, and none of the three of them was um, 
was met. It's not that the heat flux on the, sea, on the floor level was to a level that will ignite everything. It was not that it was sudden. And actually, we didn't have external flaming in, in all the windows at all. Only the windows that were next to the fire were actually seeing external flaming, and the rest um, where the air was going inwards. This is an image of the, the, the speed, the spread rate, or, well, the position, the movement of the edges of the fire. The leading edge is where the flames start to burn the fuel. In this case, where wood creeps. That's the red line over here. You can see that it starts very slowly. It starts to catch up. It resembles that T-square. Um, and then it actually, towards the end, it starts to go really fast, almost like um, accelerating in nature. It's not constant. It's not a straight line. It's clearly curved. And then is the trailing edge, which comes behind, you know, that separates the burnout. Um, behind this, 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 there is no fire, and the fire is, is here. So you can see, for example, this is time. <clears throat> this, is the burn, this will be the burning time of each of the elements that are burning. And here in distance, you will have the width of the fire that, that is burning. So in this plot, you have burning times and width of the fire. This is a little bit of an explanation of what you just saw, is we have a fuel layer, we ignite it. In the, in the case of the experiment, it was a wood creep. And then we ignite it, and then that location starts to burn, and you have a flame, a flame of a given height. The flame starts to spread over the fuel, that's the leading edge. Behind, what happens is that at some point, the first point that ignited starts to consume. There is a point where it has fully consumed, and there is no more fuel in that location. And then what happens is that the flame disappears from that location that has been consumed, that's burnout and then actually move forward. Uh, and that's the trailing edge, that's the burnout that is left behind. So what we see is this is why the fire trouble, because there are two edges. One wants to always go forward and burn more fuel, and the one behind is like, well, I've burned all the fuel and there is nothing left. And actually creates that there is a width of a fire or a, a maximum size, we call it. Um, uh, that, 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 that the fire, not, not a maximum, a characteristic size or a characteristic width that I might, might be changing in time. Uh, that, that sets the material that is burning. And so not all the slab could be burning at the same time when this is very long, only a fraction of the slab or, or the boot um, creep can actually burn. This has consequences because when you put everything together and you have now your structure here at the top, we illustrated here by some I-beams. There is one I-beam here made of steel. There is another one over here. And the fire is at the bottom, right? So if the worst case scenario where the flames are long enough that actually they are impinging on the ceiling, that's the worst case scenario because that means that the flames themselves, the hottest element in the compartment might be touching at some point the structural elements um, and the flames are propagating in this direction because we've seen that the fire travels. It means that anything that is above the flames and that is being touched by the flames because the flames might impinge and, and actually bend um, along the ceiling jet is going to be very, very hot, but only for some time typically between 15 to 25 minutes. That's what we call the near field. The near field is increased, very intense heating, is flame impingement, but for a short period of time. Whereas the rest of the time, being this ahead of the fire or behind the fire, what we are seeing is the smoke layer. There is a smoke layer that is traveling from the fire and is going in all directions, and it's just traveling around the compartment in a complex manner. And what we see, obviously, is that the farther is the flame, from the structural element, either behind or in front, the, the amount of heat, the temperature, the heating is going to be reduced. Still, it is receiving heat, but it's actually not as much as the near field. And that we call the far field. And the far field is decreasing temperatures, decreasing temperatures with, the with, with time and space, but for much longer periods. And this is obviously for a heat transfer expert fascinating, the fact that you have these dynamics, you have a fire that is moving, and it brings short intense heating and long low intensity heating. And the question is when you put everything together, which is the worst fire for the structure? And, and then this is the animation, the fire is moving, right? And then you can see different heating. Now, the traveling fires methodology that I'm going to present to you was not produced in the vacuum at all. And actually since it was produced, it has been evolved and, uh, around the planet. I just want to highlight three very important um, cor uh, uh, cornerstones um, uh, related to this work. In 1996, there were two independent, same year, magic happens, two independent, one in, in New Zealand, I think it was, and the other one was in, uh, in Belgium um, or, in, or in UK right now. I'm, I'm a little bit confused. 
1996, two methodologies appeared from structural engineers, the two of them, with different names. One was called the fire cell method. The other one's called the spreading fire. Um, these methodologies were fascinating and they fast really quickly. Within months of their work being reported in conferences and in papers, uh, they did not catch up. No one followed it and very, very little uh, build up or actually not build up on top of them. They were literally forgotten. In the year 2006, and this is something that I was involved in doing, I was leading this with one of my PhD students. Um, well, in 2006, actually, it was not with, with any PhD student yet. It was with Jose Torero. It was Jose Torero and I doing this. We came up with, an, with a new way of, of thinking about this problem. I was not aware of a previous work, and, and this is when the cat's name of traveling fire was put. Then later on, we got the attention of industry. Industry fund us to go this forward. And that's when Steph, uh, Jamie Stan Gottfried, when his PhD thesis came, this we call TFM of Tabling Fires. And um, with Jamie, we produced two more methodologies. Obviously, we, we like to think that its methodology is better than the previous. Uh, the one that we did with Jose Torero was very uh, crude, but it was a breakthrough. The one with Jamie's were more advanced, more um, uh, higher fidelity, so to speak, um, but still from our current point of view, they were still crude. Um, all the groups around the world started to see the work of, with Jamie and they started to develop other traveling fires. Okay, the idea is the same. It's a fire that is not burning uh, homogeneously. It's a, a fire that is moving. Uh, but so uh, Danny Hopkins, for example, has his own traveling fire methodology. He started to develop in 2013. Then when I moved to Imperial, I continue travel, uh, moving traveling fires methodology. Uh, we, we changed the name instead of calling it by Mark one, two or three was very confusing. We put the eye of traveling fires as in improved traveling fires because we thought and we always think that we were improving it. This is some of the work that I'm going to show you today later on. And sorry, just look at the time. Perfect. And, and we also, the Czech Republic has its own traveling fires methodology. I don't think they gave it a name. They just said traveling fires by the Czech Republic. Uh, this came out uh, more publicly in 2017, and Edinburgh at the same year, 2017, has its own traveling fires. They call it E, uh, traveling fires. E stands for enhanced, I think it is enhanced, enhanced traveling fire. And also in, in, in Imperial, my group, we have one that is uh, with flame uh, extension. Um, but I'm not going to be talking about that today. And actually, in reality, there is another one that is probabilistic. This is a never ending. Um, a pool. There is people who now have developed several automata models. Uh, so what I want to say, this is a field that is growing very quickly, is multiple methodologies and flavors are being put forward, different um, assumptions, okay? But what is important is what they have in common. So the work that I'm going to present to you today, uh, shortly, is related to this, far, is this paper in 2015. Uh, it was a part of the thesis of Egle, Egle Rakaskaute. Uh, she's now an a structural engineer uh, in Arup. And the code of these traveling fires can be downloaded. The code is um, in MATLAB, and we have also in Python, and we have it in Excel. And you just go into the repository that we have, and, and anyone can download it and use it. So there is no point at recoding the work uh, when, when can, you can just download it and use it or investigate it. So many, we know of many engineering companies that have downloaded it and use it in their methodologies. How to use it is a different thing. This is traveling fires uh, itself is just a calculation method. Uh, how to design, how you decide which is the worst fire and uh, which fire you design against is a different question. So the three key parts of any traveling fire methodology of all the ones that I've told you before are these three. And I'm going to illustrate them with the one that I know uh, the most, which is uh, our traveling fires. The first is that the burning is not uniform, so it creates near and far fields. The second one that it moves, so it travels. And the third is that we have no idea of what is going to be the speed of the leading edge and the trailing edge, which means that we don't really know the width of the fire. We call that the, far, the size of the fire. So in the traveling fires methodology that we develop, we assume that it's all steady and the traveling is steady. So we assume it has one size. But because we don't know which size he has, we are forced to investigate all sizes, which in a way is, is a replacement, it's a proxy to the fact that the fire in reality is, is changing in size as it is spreading. Um, when you look into the gas temperatures that are developed um, in any location of the ceiling, so this is time, you choose one location. What you see is that when the fire is arriving to this location, you see an increase of the temperature. This is the, the far field heating. 
Then the flames are literally under, this is a near field heating, which gives you a maximum temperature. And this is the far field, um, still posterior heating, still heating, okay? People say, oh, that's the cooling. No, that's not cooling. Actually, most of this curve is still heating up the structure. Uh, it's just that it's not as intense as the near field. And then when the fire is off, that's proper cooling. The fire has reached the end of the compartment. It has burned all the fuel in many minutes or many hours. And now it actually the flame has a stop and that's the proper cooling over here. Um, so in our methodology, what we do is with the near field, we fix it and we go to a worst case scenario of temperatures that are between 800 Celsius up to 1200 Celsius because flames at the micro scale can actually be this hot and even hotter. But at the micro scale, larger scales, that maybe it would be an I-beam or a structural beam of concrete, the average temperature looks more like at 100 um, of, the, of the gas phase. This is the actual temperature that is heating up the element. And then for the far field, we use um, correlations that are known uh, for um, giving us the temperature as a function of, of space. For example, Albert's correlation, which was developed for the activation of sprinklers, has really nice experiments where it looks into the temperature along the ceiling as a function of the distance from where the fire is impinging uh, on the ceiling, which is really nice. Then, because we don't know what is the size of the fire, we are forced to investigate what happens if the fire is only 10% of the floor area at a given time, what happens if 40%, what happens if 100%, okay? And there is a correlation when you assume a steady state between the size of the fire and the spread rate. So small fires propagate slowly, large fires propagate fast. And actually this is very nice because we use these, uh, we went around experiments and accidental um, fires and we saw speed rates. And then we actually brought that back and said, well, these are the possible spread rates. That means these are the possible sizes. This is one of the applications that we did, just so you see, this is the river temperature of a concrete um, slab that is in the ceiling and is being exposed by traveling fires, it's a calculation. Um, and this is how hot does the river temperature gets, the maximum temperature it ever gets at any point within this fire as a function of the size of the fire. This curve over here, I find it to be probably my favorite core, uh, curve of all the work that we have done. This one in particular was in the thesis of Angus Law, which you would know because he was in Queensland um, until a few years ago. And it shows you something that is not trivial and is actually fascinating. What it's showing you is that tiny little fires don't heat up the river much, and that massive fires don't heat up the river much. The two of them for different reasons. This is so slow uh, that actually the, there is plenty of time to cool off um, in the far field. And this over here, and, and when the near field arrives, it's too small. And this one is so large that actually most of the time um, it doesn't have time to it doesn't have enough time to heat up. But something happens in between. Something happens in between towards the smaller fire. Something happens at 10% and 15%, where the combination of speed and size, near field and far field, makes the rebar to be at its maximum temperature. In this particular design with this rebar depth and these specific compartment conditions, we, we see that actually a traveling fire could be taking the rebar to temperatures that structural engineers, even structural engineers, will feel uncomfortable around 550 Celsius. If the river depth will be different or the compartment will be different, this temperature could go up or down and be of more concern or less concern. You can see already this is going towards a lane substitution of the first kind, where we remove a structural engineering and we say, well, just based on a criteria of the river temperature, uh, we, can, we can say something about design, uh, about the collapse of the structure. Um, obviously, uh, these calculations that you just saw, uh, where we were heating up a concrete river comes from integrating in time numerically the temperatures of the fire, of the gas phase. We do this as everybody does with uh, solving the 1D equation in the concrete. Or if it will be a steam, a steel bar, you can assume that is thermally uh, land capacitance, so thermally thin, and then you just uh, integrate in time uh, partial um, ODE, um, a, a, a partial um, a, partial differential equation. These are um, from Buchanan, these are the state of the art. I just wanted to highlight how you go from gas temperatures to uh, structural temperatures. Uh, this is an animation, some of the results. This is a traveling fire that is moving in red um, over here. So this is the fire traveling, this is the gas temperature. So this is the near field, this is the far field, and you can see how it's moving forward. And this over here is the steel bar temperature of the element that is um, orangey. And this in gray is the temperature of the element that is here, that is uh, darker in color. So you can see how the same fire has led to two completely different histories of temperature of these two elements. 
um, sorry, in, in continuous line, that will be the gas, and in, in dash line, that will be the steel beam, okay? So you can see how this steel beam reach a temperature, a maximum temperature uh, at about 90 minutes, whereas the other one reach a maximum temperature at about 180. Um, and from my point of view, the fact that the heating is not uniform and it depends on the space and time, it just makes structural engineering more interesting. That's my point of view. And this is something that of the work that has been taken forward by structural engineers, because now the collapse mechanism is truly about the structure interacting with each other, not just one single element that it has on uniform temperature. Now what happens is that you have a part of the room that is expanding and the other part of the room is contracting. And the one in the middle has been degraded tremendously in its mechanical property, this is very hot. And, and obviously the pulling and twisting and pushing uh, of the structure is tremendous. Some of the work that we did, for example, if you look into a traveling fire that is very small, just 2.5% of the floor area at any given time, and you look into different locations and at different times, what you see is the fire is propagating in the middle. This is the highest temperature where the fire is, and away from the, where the fire is, the temperatures are lower, but with some width. Uh, if you make the fire bigger or even actually uh, much bigger, 25% or even 50% of the, of the fire, what you see is that the region of highest temperatures start to move to locations towards the end of the compartment and times towards the end of the fire. So small fires, all of them is the same. Larger fires, we are more worried about what happens towards the end of the compartment and the end of the fire. Obviously, if this were to be an accidental fire, not an experiment, we have no idea where it's going to start. Therefore, we don't know where it's gonna end. So every single structural engineer should be worried about the results from the end of a traveling fire, just because what we see is that the worst case conditions, thermally speaking, tend to be towards the end of the traveling fire, whatever that is. If you were to look into Euro code, what is called the short, hot, or the long, cold, you would see it doesn't have a spatial variation. So at every location, it is assuming flashover, no matter how long it takes, no matter that it's violating the first and second law of thermodynamics, the Euro code assumes that it's uniform burning in large compartments. And you can see uh, already by the colors that there is a significant difference in the predictions of the two tools of, of how hot does the structure get. Okay. Uh, yeah, so here at the bottom we have it. You can see, for example, these are the peak temperatures of the structural bin in this particular case, one specific one. Okay, you can see, for example, it is the 10% traveling fire, the one that leads to the highest peak temperature in the structural element, 690 degrees. Uh, whereas, for example, the short hot did not indeed match to the structure. It actually just 370. And the long cold, interesting enough, is actually 620. It's a completely different realm of magnitude of the short hot which starts to be related to the temperature that we see in some of the traveling fires. So when a structural engineer sees this, he says, in my structure that I'm designing for, that I need to design the structure of the protection, and in the compartment that I'm concerned, all these possible fires are telling me I should be looking into a smallish, but not tiny, traveling fire, because that's the worst case condition. Okay? This is how we wish we recommend and we hope that the methodologies work. We are not saying that traveling fires should be used only and get rid of the state of the art of the Euro code. We are saying everything should be looking to together and the worst case conditions should be designed for. Some structural engineers said, yes, we hear you, Guillermo, what you're saying. We don't want to design for the worst because the worst is unlikely. We want to design for the bad that is more likely. Absolutely fine. As long as traveling fire behavior is considered in that methodology, I think the success of this structure to be safer is high. This is um, a way of showing the results. This is time, this is temperature. Each of these curves is the, um, is the structural temperature uh, of the same structural element of steel beam under different S scenarios and different uh, calculation scenarios. None of it is an experiment. Um, what you can see, for example, is we have the standard fire, which is the red one, which goes to infinity, right? This is a furnace that is never turned off. So it just goes until, until it reaches a very, very high temperature. Obviously, at, after some point, it's a furnace. This is what we use um, for melting metals. At some point, you just destroy absolutely everything. And the question is, well, depending on how much it has, mesh, it has last this absolutely horrific scenario, we give it a rating, 30 minutes, one hour, two hours. But it's very difficult to compare to the standard fire because the standard fire this always wins. It always destroys the structure. The question is at what, point, at what time it stops. The Euro code is more interesting. It, it assumes that the fire cannot last forever. It will have um, a given amount of energy and um, um, a given amount of time. 
And then, the, the, for example, the Eurocode 25% ventilation is this orange over here. It, it goes up at the same speed as the standard fire, but then at some point it runs out of fuel and it starts to have the cool down the step. Okay, and it has reached a maximum over here of a maximum of about 600, I think it's 620. If we were to be Euro code 50% ventilation, that actually goes faster. This is the short hot. It goes, grows slightly faster, but then it stops and it cools down and then actually reaches a temperature of only about 500 Celsius. And then what you have here in blue is two traveling fires. One is a traveling fire with a 10% earlier in the compartment and the other one is a traveling fire with a 10% uh, you are looking at towards the end of the compartment. And you can see that the two traveling fires are leading to higher temperatures than the Euro code. And you can actually run any Euro code in between. Uh, what we see is that there is always a traveling fire that predicts a higher temperature in the structure than any of the Euro codes. Okay? And for example, if you were to compare this traveling fire with the standard fire, you would say, oh, look, this traveling fire is equivalent to my standard fire at 80 minutes. Yeah, but if you look into what happens towards the end of the compartment, what you see is, uh, is that even after 200 minutes, you were actually reaching the same temperature, roughly a little bit higher. And you were really in 19 minutes. So time, a time and a space are also important. That's what happens when you drop the assumption of uniform heating. That now a space also matters. Um, obviously, Egle is a structural engineer. I'm I'm a far scientist. So Egle was not happy that we just stop at the heat transfer and put this into the structural realm. Um, we went to our funders and said we would like to burn a multi-story building and we would like it, it to collapse. And they said, no, we don't have enough money for that. So then we just did the study computationally. So Egli took Elisdyna, very nice software that is very good for unstable, uh, for tracking the instability of a structure. Use um, a 10-story building that NIST have been doing many calculations, um, designed according to the US standard. And we just started to put traveling fires and standard fires in different stories and we just track what is happening. What you are seeing in this particular case is you're seeing the bending moments being developed. These are the colors over here. The bending moments being developed in, in, the, in the slab, uh, in the ceiling of where the fire is. This is a traveling fire. And you can also see the formation of the slab, uh, exaggerated uh, with a, a big factor, factor of five. Okay, you can see the formation of happen. And we did this with, this is a traveling fire and this is a Euro code. So this is what happens when the fire travels. You can see that the bending moments grow and decrease in time and the deformation is left behind at different times. Whereas in a Euro code, this is how current structural engineers are forced to design because they don't have all the tools if they're not aware of traveling fires. Um, the, 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 all the conditions are uniform. All the bending moments are happening mostly at the same time, except for the structural reasons and the deformations are happening. Um, and just, um, yeah, I'm just finishing now, just to put everything together, these are axial forces in the elements. Um, this is for a small traveling fire, 10% traveling fire, 25% traveling fire. This is almost half of the compartment being traveling fire and this is a Euro code. Uh, this is in time. So you can see the axial, sorry, this is the deflection in millimeters and this is the axial forces. So very quickly, what you can take a look at this is something very interesting. Is whereas of the traveling fires, we see that the 10% remains the worst because it actually reaches the, uh, the highest level or the tiny one over here, which is the highest level of axial forces and the highest level of deflections. So we always see a traveling fire towards a small to be the worst. So actually, uh, I have to move this out. Actually, um, some of the axial forces that we saw in the Euro code were as bad as the ones that we saw in the, um, in the traveling fires and some of the deflections were also as large as the ones in the traveling fires. So this is something really important and I want to highlight it, you should not be got lost in the details, is um, although a traveling fire, a ah, traveling fire, we don't know which one, but there is always a traveling fire that is worse to the structure from a thermal point of view. When we look into the structural response, not always the traveling fire is the worst. Okay, and this is fascinating because what I'm saying is that mechanical engineers like me can't not actually design the safer structure because we, if we stop at the thermal side, we will always find a traveling fire. But if we allow structural engineers to take ownership of the problem and move it forward, they will always find that, well, they will find sometimes that the worst fire for the structure is a still a Eurocode. It's not always, okay? Sometimes the traveling fire is the worst thermally and structurally. 
and, so, and, the, and the euro code is never thermally the worst, but sometimes it's the worst structurally. It just makes the problem more complicated than we thought. We just have the assumption, especially me being a mechanical engineer, that if the worst thermal behavior is in a traveling fire, obviously it's the worst for the structure. And the fascinating thing is structural mechanics in space and time is complicated enough that not always the worst temperature is the worst structural behavior. We saw this in some putting together all the hundreds of simulations of Egli. We, for example, track uh, what was the temperature of the element that failed um, and the, at the moment that it failed, and we compare that to, sorry, no, what, we did is what was the maximum temperature that the element ever got and compared to the uh, temperature that it had when it failed, okay? Um, so what it means is, did the element fail when it was heating up? And all these points are saying no. And all these points over here are saying say, yes. So interesting enough, these fires over here fail when they had what is called the posterior, um, the posterior uh, heating of a traveling fire, the fire field, posterior fire field. So all these elements cannot, the failure of these elements cannot be understood, cannot be understood by uh, a, a methodology that assumes uniform behavior. But all of them over here can, okay? Um, and this is a, a similar analysis where we put the temperature of the element that it failed compared to the peak temperature in the compartment that it happened. And, and you can see that the behavior is, uh, we're trying to answer the question is, is the element that failed located at the peak temperature? And what you can see is that sometimes it is and sometimes it is not. So what we are advocating with this is going back to the lame substitutions is that, um, this problem cannot be solved by one single discipline at any time, no substitution whatsoever. The arrival of traveling fires truly means that heat transfer experts and a structural engineering ex experts have to work together. Um, either one of them not working with each other leads to a structure that is not as good as it could be. I'm very proud to say that it was just not an academic having um, a discussion with his colleagues in the office. This work actually led to being embraced by industry. Now I know of about 10 companies around the world that have been using traveling fires one way or another. It, as I said, traveling fires are different flavors of traveling fires. And then within the flavor, there are different ways of using that in your design. The, 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 first, pers the first engineering company using this methodology was Adobe. Adobe has designed about 10 to 15 iconic buildings around the world on this, mostly in the UK. Uh, but it has picked up by competitors in the UK and it has picked up by other people in, the, um, in Asia, in the Middle East, in Canada, in the United States is being discussed. Okay? So now at, at this point, I know of at least 42 beautiful buildings. All of them are beautiful. I don't know which one is more beautiful, where the traveling fire methodology has been used. And we actually have a skyline of traveling fires. Now, when I mean traveling fires, this is not the traveling fire that we developed in, in Edinburgh in 2006 six, or in, in Imperial. I mean traveling fires, different flavors that I've been told about. This 42, probably now if I were to do a survey, it will go up to about 55. And if I were to be told about people that are doing this that are not in communication with us, probably this easily goes uh, into the hundreds. Um, so I claim this is success. We are engineers, we are scientists, but we want to make the buildings uh, safer. And, and hopefully uh, we think so, that these buildings are, are safer and they are using the structural uh, resistance or the additional structural engineering in the places where it's needed uh, in these buildings because he considers that large compartments can burn with um, traveling fire. So I'm just finishing. Um, thanks for being with me. I just want to finish saying that um, in large compartments, in large compartments, flashover is unlikely. Flashover as it used to be defined Definitely, it's not going to happen. And then there are groups that are saying, well, it's flashover. We call it flashover, but it's not how it was. Okay, fine. We, we means that we have a new flashover um, discussion. But flashover, or what is called in structural engineering, post-flashover fires, is unlikely in a large compartment. It will probably, the fire will travel. That there are methodologies with our different flavors that are complementing met traditional methods. This is a big effort, actually, of myself. Uh, as a heat transfer expert, I could have made traveling fires to be amazing for heat transfer experts and absolutely nightmare for structural engineers. But I, I realized that if this is not used by structural engineers, there is no hope for this work. So I made an effort to dial down the heat transfer parlance, okay? 
and, 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 and actually make it more um, appealing to structural engineers, to make it complementary to the methods that they were using already. This led to some experts in heat transfer being unhappy about what I did. Absolutely fine. I did it for a good reason. But actually, it led to structural engineers embracing the work. And now that they are embracing the work, now we can take them slowly, um, one step at a time, towards more complex heat transfer, which obviously is really what I, as an expert in heat transfer, would love to be with many uh, of heat transfer experts as well. Uh, with traveling fires, what we see is that although it leads to the more onerous thermal conditions, it doesn't lead always to the more onerous structural conditions. So there is not such a thing as a worst case um, fire. When we look into not just the time or the location for collapse, when we look into the type of collapse, the collapse mechanism, what we see is, and this is just barely touched with, together um, with Egle and with David Lang, this is just touching the structure, the, the, the scratching the surface of the phenomena that traveling fires leads to different ways of collapsing, um, which is itself uh, quite interesting. And, and that this is a case of transfer of knowledge from academia to industry, which as engineers, we, we should be very happy of, of doing. Um, okay, perfect. And with this, I'm finishing. Um, I'll be happy to answer your questions uh, now. Hi, Jeremy. Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, it was an amazing presentation. Uh, we have some uh, questions from our attendees as well as some comments. I think the first two are more comments than questions. Ah, no, the second one, yeah. What design criteria or measures do you recommend for curbing these fires in design? What should designers incorporate into their designs to make buildings safe? Uh, this is asked from the point of view of an architectural designer. Yeah, so the, the answer is yes. If the compartment and the design is large, and and we don't know what large means. We, we know that probably, probably is larger than 100 meters square of floor area. But we are not sure truly if it's in reality 50 or if it's 150. So it's around the floor area of 100 meters square. We know that it is possible that the fire will not flash over. Uh, it's actually likely that the fire will not flash over. And therefore, the fire will still burn very ferociously um, as a traveling fire. And I would strongly recommend that the structural engineer considers not just flashover fires, but also traveling fires. And then he decides on the one that is more damaging to the structure as a design consideration. Thank you for your response, Guillermo. Uh, also, uh, you're being asked that building codes often ignore uh, costs that borne by the community by fires that have uh, occurred in buildings uh, for political gain. Um, yeah, he's, he's wondering if maybe building codes ignore certain kind of codes related or that could be borne by the community related to fire. Yeah, so building codes um, is a very long, complex, uh, and, and not a straightforward process to come out with an agreement among the interested parties. Most of these parties are in the committee for the, any, any, any code, being in any country or any field, is mostly about industry because mm -hmm. these are the people who really use the codes. You, you would know that academics, we don't use codes. We, we, we influence the codes, maybe. We have opinions on the codes. We don't we just use them. It's, it's industry who use them. So it's industry who has more invested, interested in the codes. So they typically put more emphasis in being present in the committees. And obviously what happens is that all these people get together and each of them are bringing their, their side of the influence. They all have an opinion of what should happen and they try to reach an agreement. The interesting thing is that out of this very human, very subjective uh, process, which happens very often uh, away from um, light and typewriters, uh, they reach somehow an agreement. One day they reach an agreement. It could be an amazing agreement. It could be a crap agreement, but they reach an agreement and that is the standard. And then the process has to be repeated every few years. So as an academic that has been involved in this, um, in 
and I have this is not something that they teach you. At least no one taught me how this works. This is just by experience and by observing and by trying and by failing. I can tell you the process is tremendously intense. There is a lot at stake. Um, and it's good that academics are present and they try to influence this process. But it's also good that academics are not in charge. Uh, because if standards were set by academics, if, if the standards were set by me, it would be a very crappy standard that it would be a lot of fun, but I don't think it will actually be safe. It's good that academics are there, it's good that industry is there, and it's good that there are discussions. I just think that, for example, it could be more transparent or they could actually reach out explicitly to more academics and more fields that might not be present. Right. Yeah, pretty, pretty precise. Uh, when you have a lot of stakeholders, then things could be either go perfectly or perfectly wrong. It, it, uh, it, most of the time, it's, not, no, it's never perfect. Especially yeah, I mean, as, as an academics, as, no, we, we are a field where we believe that perfection exists, right? It, no one outside academia thinks like that. So we, we think it's like, oh, I, I know how perfect looks like. And then we look into the standard, it's like, oh, wow, this is definitely exactly. not it, okay? But when you look to industry, they look at us saying like, yeah, are you in your ivory? We are a little bit in our ivory tower, okay? Obviously, we, we try to come down of the tower and, and, and walk around the wall often, and some people more than others, but we, we are academics. We, we, our perfection is not what industries would be just go ahead with. Money. Yeah, All right. So in another question, uh, maybe more related to your research is, is how should a, a structural fire engineer consider the deflection of a steel element when they are exposed to a traveling fire? Sorry, can you, can you say the beginning of the question again, Tomás? Uh, yeah, how well, should a structural fire engineer consider the deflection of a steel element when they are exposed to traveling fire? That is a very good question. As a mechanical engineer, I should not have too much of an opinion on that. Uh, what I can tell you is that it's not, it's not a straightforward to know what is going to be the deflection of a steel member being exposed to any fire. And it's not a straightforward to know what is the, the level of an, the unacceptable level of deformation. There is a lot of confusion in the community about which level of deformation is acceptable and is not. And it depends, there are different criteria for deformation, there are different criteria for structural failure. And I am, uh, I am fascinated by that, that debate. I hope that our work has contributed to that debate, but I don't know the answer. All right. Um, and following with that kind of uh, questions, uh, one of our attendees is wondering if the model if somehow it considers 3D uh, fuels, like fuels stacking and different rack storages, or maybe different cubicles in a 3D grid or distribution. Yeah, that, that's, that's a good question. And you can see how the field has developed. We actually started 3D. When we started to do this work in Edinburgh in 2006, we went 3D. We used FDS, Fire Dynamic Simulator to give us the temperatures uh, around the compartment. Uh, very quickly, it, it was obvious that it's an overblown. It was, it was like trying to kill a fly with a, with a canyon. Um, it was, I mean, if you hit the, the fly, then you win, but you are wasting an incredible amount of everything everywhere trying to kill the fly. Um, there were so many things we didn't know that it was not justified to go 3D. So we went 1D. We went very simple. We went near field, far field, that's it. And little by little, step by step, we move it forward. Uh, when we went structural, it was very clearly earlier on that 1D structural domains have no interest whatsoever. So it has to be two dimensional. So you can see that whereas the fire is one dimensional or very simplified um, zones, the structural one is 2D for a good reason. The building that I showed you with 10 stories is 2D. And in reality, we wanted to go 3D with the building Okay, because the building by NIST, the one that I show you in a slide in 2D was 3D. And Egle, as a structural engineer, recognized that the formations and pushing and twisting and, and, and pulling of the building is in reality 3D. We could not because the computational time meant that instead of having hundreds of simulations where we could learn by running many simulations, you could only do three simulations. 
So I said, Egle, do you want a PhD thesis with three simulations? And we don't know anything about these three simulations. Or you want a PhD thesis with 200 simulations where we can actually learn something about the structural behavior. And she decided to go with the 2D. And I was very happy about that decision. Yeah, it's always a balance between uh, the resources you have and the goals you want to achieve in the end. And yeah, also talking about assumptions for the model, um, one of our attendees uh, says that he has the feeling that you are suggesting that the DFM is good addition because it defines a more critical scenario for certain structures in certain conditions. However, some parts of the TFM are based on big assumptions. For example, the 1200 near field temperature. So the question is, after this introduction, how close to reality is this methodology? And if you have measured or recorded these temperatures in the tests you have conducted? Okay, that's an awesome question. And I think I've devoted six years of my life to answer it. So I'm, I'm, I'm sad that has, the answer has not been read, but it's written in many places. So first, of course, traveling fires, any traveling fire, not just ours, has assumptions. And check assumptions, because if we don't make this, there is no progress. Uh, if we try to solve all the laws of nature, conservation of momentum and um, conservation of mass, conservation of species, conservation of deformations, conservation, we would never be able to do absolutely anything of interest to anyone as engineers. So we have to make assumptions to allow us to contribute to where we think it is most needed. In traveling fires, we have a list of 200 assumptions, but we have less assumptions than the state of the art, which was zero codes, standard curves, um, and, this, and the Swedish scores. So the idea is that as progress is happening, we are reducing and the number of assumptions and we are checking the assumptions and their validity. So this is called progress scientific progress. Traveling fires of any of the nine flavors that I show you is not the end of it. It will be very sad if that will be the end of it. I hope that in 10 years, if I invited again by UQ to give this talk, that I would be presenting you not just one slide with nine flavors, but maybe six slides with 60 flavors. It will be my absolute joy to show you this because it means progress is happening. The assumptions are being checked. Some of them have been um, proven to be wrong. Some of them have proven to be okay. And some of them have been improved. And regarding the traveling fires methodology mark two that said that the near field was only 1,200 Celsius. This is work that we did in 2012. It's not uh, that, like that anymore since 2012. Um, I got an incredible amount of um, unfriendly comments from many heat transfer experts about this. Actually, no, it, fascinating. Heat transfer experts were quiet. The structural engineers were very unhappy to hear that a flame can actually be 1,200 Celsius. Very unhappy. They've never seen this before. As a person that comes from combustion, right? I, I study the fundamentals of combustion in Austin and in California. I was fascinated that they don't know that flames can actually reach 2,000 cells Kelvin, 1,600 Kelvin. Uh, no, in, in Celsius, it will be easily 1,500 Celsius. This is not controversial. This has been measured and has even got Nobel prizes uh, for, for work. Uh, so it was interesting conversation to have, the fact that if you have a thick thermocouple and you put it any random place in a compartment and you see that your maximum temperature is 900 that then everybody says therefore the maximum temperature of the flame is 900 it's like no the maximum temperature that, that you measure with your thick thermocouple is 900 and that is the average of the parts of the flame which are extremely hot which actually can be hotter than 1200 celsius and other parts that are not as hot i recognize very quickly on that the structural engineers that were unhappy about this had a point and the fact is that the structural elements are not thin uh, nor is small, are tend to be bulky and big. So therefore, a temperature of 1,200 in the gas, um, although it was a worst case scenario, it was too bad as a worst case scenario. So it was what they call an unlikely worst case scenario because the flame itself was going to average itself and, it was, and the structure was not going to see the flame as parts of 1,200 Celsius. The, the, the fire, the structure starts to see the flame as 900 or 800. 
since then, since 2012, the methodology of EGLE is called the ITFM, Improved Traveling Fires, recognizes that you can actually quickly find justification if you have a big fire or you have a big structural element to decrease that peak temperature down to 800. The fascinating result is that this didn't change an, a tiny little bit the results. Traveling fires continue to be the worst case condition, maximum temperature, and continue to be not always the worst in the structures. Um, so although some structural engineers were happy to see that we decreased the maximum temperature in the near field, this had no impact. And, and some people are still um, refer to the work that we did in 2012. All right, thank you for your answer. Uh, some other of our attendees maybe is asking for um, resources where comparison between the chart and fire model and real life experiments has been done. Yes, uh, that also, that's a very frequent question. That also, it usually in industry, they, they would say, is this validated? Right? Uh, and that's a really good question. Actually, to the point, I'll, I'll show you just this slide. My next slide, I'll show it to you. These are the most frequently asked questions. Uh, or you can imagine that over the last 15 years that I've been working on this, I've got many questions, and some of them are happening very often. So if you look into the first one, the first one. The first one is the question I just answered, right? They say, oh, the near field is too hot. Um, I also get very often, what is the best traveling fire? I also get, the third question is the one that you're asking me to do. Uh, is the traveling fire methodology, any of them, validated? And the answer, which has been changed very recently, is not fully. Not fully because no one has still put the detail uh, attention to this. And actually, I think as I speak, uh, maybe, maybe that is UQ is doing this, actually. Um, maybe you, I think the, David Lang has told me that there is an interest in, in Queensland into doing this. Um, where what, obviously, I'm, I don't know how you're doing it, but I'm sure that is just go around all the experiments with large compartments where fire may be traveled, and you put them all together and you compare that to fire uh, predictions by different methodologies and then you compare them. And I am absolutely convinced that they are not going to see a perfect match. Obviously, they are going to see a significant mismatch, but I am convinced as well that the predictions in a thermal point of view are going to be um, of a higher accuracy for traveling fires than for Euro codes. That I am convinced. And we cannot compare with the standard fire because the standard fire doesn't end, it's infinite, right? Um, so the question is, is it validated? Not, not fully and not yet. And probably will take a significant amount of time to validate it. And validation itself will lead to changes in traveling fire and improvements, but it's definitely better validated than the standard fire and the Euro code. That for sure, because no one has um, observed um, uh, a Euro code fire in, in a large compartment. All right. Uh, thank you for your question. Yeah, I'm aware part of the research here is quite related, uh, but I'm uh, not participating in it direct that directly, so I I couldn't add on your answer. Yep. Uh, on another question, there are two pretty similar questions, and is related to the ventilation of the compartment and how it affects the the charging fire. And maybe if there are some uh, ranges of application for the traveling fire methodology in terms of the ventilation size or the compartment size or the way the compartment is uh, built or the building is designed. Yeah, that, that's a very good question. And very few answers are available. Not, not just that I don't have enough answers, is that pretty much it's a state of the art question that is a research topic as we speak, the effect of ventilation in traveling fires. I'll tell you why it's important for two reasons. Um, many few people have looked into this. Actually, as I, as I speak, I'm involved in experiments where for the first time I've been involved in looking into this experimentally, too early to share the results. I'm sure other ones are doing something else, but I'll tell you why this is complex. One is in the original work of the World Trade Center, some of the parties that were investigated in this, even before we arrived, they immediately hypothesized that the fire was traveling because ventilation patterns. This was an hypothesis. They said the fire is traveling because the windows are breaking uh, because of the fire. 
and that was an hypothesis. Now I can prove you that hypothesis is wrong because we've seen in our experiments in Warsaw and many other experiments of other places, the fire traveled and we didn't have to break the windows, the windows were open. So although it could be that there are regimes of behavior where the ventilation and the breaking of windows is driving the spread of a fire, at least it's not the driver or not the only driver. And the second is there is, in, in my mind at least, and in the mind of many people, we start to see traveling fires as the behavior that we observe in forest fires. Um, I don't know how familiar are you in, in, well, actually UQ actually has research on forest fires, the larger scale fires. The forest fires, all of them are traveling. They burn one patch of forest at a given time, the field is consumed and, and the burnout, uh, the, the trailing edge appears, right? So in a way, you could say that a very large compartment that is burning, it is like a forest fire with a ceiling. Obviously, the ceiling has massive consequences in the radiation feedback and the, the enclosure, the entrainment of the smoke layer, etc. So it's not just a traveling fire. It's, sorry, it's not just a forest fire. But it is obvious, and you look into the literature of forest fires, that wind is the number one or the number two most important parameter in the behavior of a forest fire. So of course, in a traveling fire, wind, which in a building we call it ventilation, of course, ventilation is gonna be important. Of course, it cannot be not important. It's impossible, it's gonna be important. The question is how? And who is going to be investing into looking into this experimentally and numerically, analytically, and how the work is gonna move forward and how it's gonna be uh, integrated and presented to the community. Because it could happen, that will be my fear, has always been my fear with this, is that this is put forward in a scientific way that industry cannot understand. Not because they're not smart enough, it's because they cannot afford this level of complexity in their design. And that would be when science can claim amazing success that has no impact. That is scenario, I fear it because as an engineer, I'm an engineer, I'm a scientist. I really want uh, the science that I'm involved with to have a serious chance of having an impact in society. A chance, at least a chance, right? And, and when I do studies where I know there is no chance because they are totally fundamental, I, I don't present them to engineering companies. I present them to the other, no, the Combustion Institute and the people who are not going to be looking into this. But traveling fires is not a fundamental topic of research. Traveling fires is, is, is a society topic of, is applied research from my point of view. Okay, thank you for your answer. And linking into that last um, affirmation you made there, one of our attendees is wondering how receptive are fire brigades around UQ or the European Union to use the traveling fire methodology instead of the Eurocode or similar it. compartment fire. They love it. I, I can tell you one, I mean, obviously, the, I think traveling fires now, no matter which flavor, is a success story. Uh, obviously, it started a long time ago, 15 years ago, but it, it can now be claimed that it's, as, it's by any way you want to measure it, it's a success story. Now, at some point, it was not clear that it was going to be a success story. Um, at many points, it was not clear. But I can tell you, when this happens, it's not because, oh, wow, traveling fires is such an amazing intellectual breakthrough. It's because it got the support from many different players at different times. We were given opportunities we were not even dreaming of, and many serendipity things happened. One of the things that we never thought about, and it happened and it was key, was the fire brigades of London and the fire brigades of the UK absolutely love the work to the point that I know of many officers of the fire brigades of the UK that were asking me for copies of the PhD thesis of Jamie Stan Gottfried. I don't know how often you are asked by officers of the fire brigade for PhD thesis, not papers, not magazines, not give me a presentation, no, let's have a meeting. Copies of the PhD thesis. I'm not sure what they did with them, okay? And it was not just one, I think I can think of five, and they, they were distributing copies of the thesis because this was the digital times among their colleagues. And I know of many meetings between authorities and engineers, it is that in the UK, where the fire brigades went to the engineers and said, I don't like your structural design. What, what do you mean? I did it with Abacus, I did it with Ellis Dyna. What, what, what's wrong with it? This, I would like you to use traveling fires. And the engineers said, traveling what? What is this? I never hear this word. 
and the fire brigade gave him a copy of the thesis of, the of Jamie Stengroffin and says, read this. Next time we meet, I would like you to consider this scenario. We never thought of the fire brigades being involved in the transfer of knowledge between academia and industry. We never thought of this, we never accounted for this. And obviously, I'm tremendously happy for them. And as I speak, I still get very often emails from the fire brigade where they are always want traveling fires to be better. Instead of criticizing it, they always say, we like it, we want it to be used, to be used here. Can you make it like that? Can you make it like that, right? As opposed to the academic stand of, hmm, your work is not good enough. I'm going to start from scratch. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you for your answer. Um, just a remark before our next question from Martin McLegan. Uh, says you're right about the validation here at UQ, but he's not sure uh, Eurocodes are included in that validation though. Yeah. And, well, that's a pity because if, if it's yeah. compared, just yes, maybe the authors are present. If you just compare to standard fire, you cannot compare. You cannot compare a real fire with a furnace. Yeah, fire. yeah, I agree. Uh, then, then there are a couple of questions pretty related. One is about the shape of the compartment, but maybe this one is more relevant. How does a traveling fire methodology translate into a car park? Shouldn't this represent a, a scenario where uniform thermal exposure many times is far from the reality? Yeah, so they, they have been, so first, it's two questions in reality. The shape of the compartment could be very important. Um, Edinburgh and, I mean, the first paper, the first paper that we published on this with Angus Law, look into the shape of a compartment or the path that the fire takes. And we saw that it's actually secondary or even tertiary. Yes, results change, but it's way more important uh, if the flames are touching the ceiling or way more important what is the, um, the size of the fire. But the path, the specific path of the fire takes, if there is a core, for example, in the center of the open plan office, as it happened in the World Trade Center, if the fire travels around or across or, or diagonally, yes, it, it changes the results, but not that much compared to other parameters that have much stronger impact. The second one is car parks. I've seen very often the result, the response of people from the structural design of car parks. And they say, oh, this will be very interesting for car park design. And in reality, the car park people, they consider fires that it starts to be like an early traveling fire because they consider always that there is a fire in one car. And then they say that the fire can actually spread to maybe three or four cars. And they stop there. They literally stop there. And they stop there typically because they are looking into life safety. So they say more than five cars, there is no way there is people inside. And now I am allowed to collapse it because it's a car park. The insurance is not worth it. You, people, I'm, I mean, this could be controversial. People prefer for the car park to collapse than, than oh, well, uh, unless it's a car park that has a whole building with people on top of it. Um, but there is a significant amount of uh, potential for fires that could be traveling to be applied to car parks, indeed. All right, thank you for your question. And again, Guillermo, thank you for your great presentation today. A really insightful one. Uh, we would also like to thank all of our attendees for coming. Uh, please uh, keep following us in our social media. We'll be sharing Thanks. our next event. And um, yeah, thank you, Guillermo, again. No, thank you. Thank you so so much to you, Thomas, and, and to all your colleagues and to UQ. Uh, you, you know this already, but I'm gonna say it explicitly. You are a very modern and very buoyant uh, fire research group. You have an incredible amount of visibility. So what you do, you are very good at making sure that people are aware of it. That is fantastic. Also, the quality of your work is really good, way above the average of the field. And I'm really happy to see uh, the group doing so well. You, as a group, did not exist until 2012, I think it is. So uh, at the same time as I was moving to Imperial, uh, Jose Torero moved to Queensland. That's the beginning of your group. So you are doing absolutely excellent. Uh, in a way, your group is the same age as my group, um, Hayes Lab at Imperial College. Obviously, me is just one academic, and you have plenty of academics. So we share a lot in vitality, modernity, 
and, and origins, okay? But you are doing fantastic. And my group adores the work that is coming from your group. And I know of many groups around the world that adore the work that you and that UQ is doing. So well done. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, we hope uh, we can foster some spaces for collaboration and discussion, which always brings very results or, well, at least some new results to discuss, yeah. Thank you again to all our attendees and have a nice weekend, a uh, nice rest of the day for all the people from Europe and a nice night from the ones who join us from Australia. Thank you very much. Thanks, and thank you. See Bye you bye. next event. Bye. Bye.